And they were talking about um, the ISIS was up north. And the sad part was they said, oh, we can't afford to lose more pilots because we had a couple of pilots. They already got assassinated and just getting out of their doors in the house. I, I would always carry a civilian clothes. So if something goes wrong, we would be able to just change and run away and, you know, go somewhere in the village or, you know, nobody can recognize who I was, which is very upset to think about that not only you are afraid of what the plane can do and what can go wrong. I was more afraid of what if I get caught by the Taliban. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I served war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have a fantastic combat story, unlike many we've hosted before, as we welcome Niloufar Romani, Afghanistan's first female aviator and someone who has overcome tremendous adversity to simply serve her country. This episode is a great reminder about how great we have it in America, what our involvement in Afghanistan meant to so many people like her, and what perseverance and sacrifice really look like for an individual and a family. We've hosted so many guests who had challenges growing up with homelessness, absent parents, and yet somehow, despite the odds, found their way to the military. This story is likely the most challenging we've heard in terms of getting into uniform from exile and defined societal norms, and is absolutely the most challenging we've heard when it comes to how difficult and dangerous it was to just wear a uniform and serve every day. Niloufar would be the first many times. It's one of the first women recruited into the Afghan military in flight school to graduate and even fly the C-130. She was awarded the U.S. International Women of Courage Award, met the First Lady, flew at the Blue Angels, and has had many other adventures. Eventually, she was granted asylum in the United States because it was too dangerous for her to return to Afghanistan. She's written a great book about her experiences titled Open Skies, My Life as Afghanistan's First Female Pilot, and she and her husband, an American veteran, opened a company called the Afghanistan Tribal Rug Trading Company, where you can get rugs from Afghanistan while helping support the women who make them. Despite the tragic fall of Afghanistan in 2021, Niloufar's story has a happy ending and, as she'll be the first to point out, is not finished being written. Although she didn't say it, I suspect we'll see her flying one day in an American uniform. Many thanks to former guest Ryan Stinger Fischel, who got us in contact to make this interview happen. And with that, please enjoy this inspiring story from somebody who was truly a groundbreaker in her field. Niloufar, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you for having me. I think one of the uh, the things I'd like to start out with is how we got connected, which was through a mutual um, acquaintance, somebody who has been on the show before, Ryan Stinger Fischel, um, obviously a, an aviator himself. And I'd love to understand what the two of you were doing flying, whether it was in a class or some other endeavor. Um, before we kick off. And I was hoping we could start there. Well, absolutely. Um, of course, um, you know, life is always have different chapters in life. You know, there's like a book. I always see a life, everyone's life, myself included. Um, it's like a book. You never know what's the next chapter. You never know unless you just flip that page. And uh, for me, after a long time of now be able to fly and I have lost that dream of flying and, you know, always wanted to be a fighter pilot. And unfortunately, we didn't have that uh, fighter jets. Um, so just to make the story short, how we met, um, I started working um, for, with a charter company that um, Jared Isaacman, he is uh, a commercial astronaut and he has his own MiG-29s, L-39s, Alpha jets and um, when I started working for him and I was so amazed with the fighter jets and, you know, I always wanted to fly one of them. And he was like, don't worry, I, you're going to have so many opportunities to do that. And I was like so excited and happy. So we, uh, end up in, uh, Bozeman, Montana and, um, the other pilots that was flying with him for the formation, um, it was Ryan and I got to meet him there and, um, 
just shared stories and uh, we just uh, met and he was just wonderful. Like every other personal and uniform that I have met an entire my life. And he's like, I want your story, you know, to be told at um, one of my friends podcast. And um, I was like, absolutely. I totally have a high respect for people on uniform. And the reason I always say I achieved everything in life and I am a life Um, it's because of those people in uniform and I cannot say no. So that's how we start, uh, started and I got to meet him. Just a great person, um, great pilot. And, uh, it's just amazing always how you get to meet some people along the way. That is great. And, um, yeah, so we had Ryan on here obviously, and then I got to go fly in an L39 and I want to hear if you've done that already. But when I went up, I had to ask Ryan for advice on how to not throw up. And I still ended up throwing up on my first flight. <laughs> That's totally fine. <laughs> Have you been up in those fast movers yet? Yes, actually. Um, like I never had a chance myself to fly fighter because in Afghanistan, we had none fighter jets. Um, so I kind of stuck with the fixed wings and these other planes. Um, the first, first ever time that I got to fly in a fighter, it was F-18 with the Blue Angel. So I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what Jesus, I didn't know how G affects you. And I didn't know what should I do. And of course, when, uh, you know, like they fly, they have, they don't wear G suits because they just want to look very cool. And I was like, all right, I can do this. So, um, we just flew and, um, I think it was like up to seven G's. And since then I tested myself. I was like, that was first time. I didn't expect that to be this much fun. I thought I would be like all over the place, throw up and none of that happened. And since then I, I knew like how much I'm motivated and excited about these fast, you know, jets and speeds and all that, uh, fun things that they can do with the jet that we can't do with other planes. <laughs> uh, so that was my very first experience. And then uh, when I met, uh, when I start working for the this company, uh, they actually, um, the owner, he flies the uh, MiG-29 himself, Jared. And um, so that was my first ride uh, to go up with him. So that was completely a blast time. And I had so much fun. And sometimes it just makes me cry. I'm like, how did I got here? How come my wishes get granted? And then uh, they were like, okay, you got to fly with the MiG. Now you can try the Alpha, but it's not going to be as as fun. And then I did that. I started um, like going to for another ride with Alpha Jet. I was like, mm, yeah, it's not as much as, you know, how fun the MiG is. And then the third one, I went to L39. That just sounded like a little 172s, just yeah. faster, a little faster. And I was like, wow, okay, so that's a big difference. Um, but they all were fun. They all were, I got to uh, do some maneuvers that I never did in my life. And it was definitely fun. That's great. I'm so jealous. And I, I obviously, so I've read your book, Open Skies. Uh, the subtitle is My Life as Afghanistan's First Female Pilot. And it's great. I highly recommend it to people. And we're going to talk about a lot of the experiences that come up in the book. But one of them is your flight with the Blue Angels. And I'm incredibly jealous that you got to do that. Um, one of the other items that came up was your favorite movie. And I want to confirm that it was Top Gun, as you mentioned. Is that your favorite like kind of Hollywood movie? Is there an Afghan movie that you also enjoyed? Or, or was it just Top Gun all the way? I think it was just in general, because I have always as a child been so fascinated with speeds and these jets. And that's how it got me to actually pursue this dream. And um, the movie, the first time I have seen it, it just felt so real. And I just wanted to be in that jet. And I wanted to like, experience that. And I think since that, um, um, I think that and there's two movies that always have specific places in my heart. And I don't know why it's just the planes and it's funny, but it's avatars too, just because I love natures and it just gives me so much, you know, like um, it just completely gives me different feeling. Um, so these are still my favorite movies and I think it always will be. That's So that's Top Gun and Avatar. Yes. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. I did not see that one coming. Um so Neelu Far, if it's okay, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to jump to your childhood for a bit. And I think of all I've interviewed, you know, 150 veterans, mainly Americans, and a lot of them have tough roads just to get into service. Um, yours is no exception how hard it was, but I think your story 
is probably the hardest I've ever heard for once you got into service and the experience you had. So we'll get to that. But um, one of the commonalities you and I share um, from reading your book, uh, we both lived in Pakistan as children. So I lived there uh, in the early 90s for several years in Islamabad. And I traveled down to Karachi. But your book starts out with you as a young girl in Pakistan. And I was hoping we could start there. What were you doing there as an Afghan? And what brought you back to Afghanistan? Absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes looking back to my childhood and how much a person can go through and what is your fault, sometimes you can't even resolve that answer, like find that answer. I think that been always uh, my struggle as well, because until now, uh, when people ask me about birth certificate, I don't have it. Like, I just don't have a birth certificate. And I like to just make joke of that. I'm like, I'm a human with no border. Like every country can be my country because yeah, a birth certificate cannot just prove, yeah, it can prove where you are from, but it's the matter of just borders made us a different, you know, just create this difference uh, between each one of us. But when you think in general, we are all human. And, um, you know, like for me, when I was born, I was, it was just in the middle of civil war in Afghanistan. I was born at home and my mom couldn't even make it to the hospital. Our building next door just got shot by rockets. And um, it was very hard for for a family. Like I have uh, my mom, my older sister, my brother and me being just born. Um, the situation of the country was really, really bad. And you never knew when somebody will attack you and get to your home. And my mom and my other, other siblings, um, I was only six months old when my parents, um, they start migrating to Pakistan because that was the only place um, we could go because that was the only place um, we didn't need a visa. We could just cross the border and go and save us. And that's what my father did. He decided to save his family and we start, um, thank God I don't remember, but sometimes hearing the stories from my parents, it just breaks my heart that how bad they spent when they were young, the the time that they had to enjoy their ages that, um, you know, probably like my parents were very young about it, but all they remember is war and how to save their children and their family. And going through the borders and getting to Pakistan, of course, we didn't know anyone. All it was for all most of the Afghans, like my family, there was a camp and we all just went there. And unfortunately, uh, just growing up in a refugee camp, it's not fun. It's like, I re probably the very, very young age, thank God, I don't remember, but, um, you know, spending a couple of years there and all you can just, you know, go to sleep. It's a tent, wake up, the, the sound of wind, the dust that blows in there. There's no school. There's no running water. There's no electricity. Um, you don't feel like a human being, actually. And all you hear is from other people that we are not good enough. And this is not our country. And it just gives you the very, very bad feeling. And I think as a child, your brain is not that, you know, developed that you just ignore these things. It just really, really gets onto you. And I remember it was very hard um, to just grow up like that. And I never wish that up on any child. And that's why I say, you know, sometimes when the life gets easy, we forget where we come from. We forget how much other people in the world struggle just for having an easy life, a bread on their table, a bed to sleep on, a roof on their head. Sometimes it gets it gets completely forgotten. And we just have to every time remind ourselves that there is someone else in this world wish to have our life. The simple thing that we just take for granted every day. And, um, you know, like that time, the happy moments was for me just to look at it in the sky and just see a bird. And, you know, I didn't want to have a limit. I didn't want to be a person with the limitation. I didn't want to carry weights because, you know, like putting weights on a bird, you just take it away from a bird to fly away and just, fly. And I didn't want that. And I thought, unfortunately, that's how I had to spend my childhood. And, you know, just being under a situation that is no one else's fault, beside, you know, your country, the people that are in power, um, they're so stingy of the power that they don't think about 
the child's about the generation that are born in this country, what they have to go through. And being a female, that even made it more difficult for me just because as a female in Afghanistan, um, there's nothing against men. Sometimes it has been mistaken in the world that it's religion that abandoned women from certain things. Uh, I'm not a religious person myself. Um, I am actually, uh, at this point, I don't follow any religion just because it just separates us as a human being. Um, as I said, it just mm. separates us. It just makes us to see each other in a different way. And I hate to see that. I hate to see the difference. And I hate to see um, what cause in the world just because we think we are different and one thing is separating us. But according to what I wanted to just say is um, it's nothing to do with the religion, that religion told the men in our country to be so violent against women, to take this right from women. It's all about the culture and how the men think they can have the power to just take 50% of the society away from, you know, education, from anything that can help out a country. And it all comes from that men power in the country because it's a very, very male dominated. And um, so much violence, so much violence against women. Everything is just against women. Um, I just wanted to fly away and just go away from all these violence. And um, I think my childhood, the most I can remember is um, just to feel the freedom of even being a bird would make me happy than being a human or a woman in that society. You know, one of the things that struck me as I as I was reading the book, pretty much throughout your life, that as it's covered from a young age, it's almost like you couldn't be accepted anywhere. So if you were in Pakistan, well, you weren't Pakistani, you're Afghan, so you should be gone. When you go back to Kabul and you're in Afghanistan, you're a different ethnic group than others, and you're a woman, and you have aspirations. Um, and it just seemed like a constant theme, even when you're in uniform and you're flying, you're still an outcast um, as a female. Uh, which just seems like such a struggle early on. But I do think it's worth mentioning, if you can share a little bit more about your mother and father, especially your father, because he plays such a big role in your in your life, of course, but he doesn't have these um, preconceived notions of what a woman should do, apparently. And I, it, I think it's described a little bit because of maybe how he saw Afghanistan before the Taliban really took over. I think that's absolutely it. Um, because, you know, most of the time, people in the world just know Afghanistan from war, Taliban, like murders and all these negative things. They think Afghanistan is like, this is the whole picture of Afghanistan. But unfortunately, we had a story. Afghanistan had a very, very nice stories in the back. It was a beautiful country with a beautiful culture, freedom for women. Women could do anything they want. Like my mom, she was a free woman. She didn't have to cover herself. She did, She could do anything she wanted. She could be anything she wanted to be. She went to school. She, she, um, anything she wanted to be, there was no, uh, stop for her. And nobody back then in sixties and seventies would stop her for pursuing her dreams or be educated. The same as my father, they were both grow up in a very, um, great time of Afghanistan when Afghanistan was a place that tourists would go there because of the beauties of, um, it's a very beautiful country with a very, very long story. And unfortunately, the war just torn apart and took all that story of Afghanistan and washed it away. And nobody even recognized that. And sometimes for me, um, it's very interesting. Like, I can't find the answer that how come my father been so different? Because as a young age, I knew, um, you know, he was my best friend. Like anything I could just share, I could share with him. And you know, most of the girls in Afghanistan, the only, the very, very first people that stops them is their father and their brothers, that they just think, no, if you just go out of the house, if you try to do anything which is not okay in our culture, it can bring a shame to our family. And this is the first step in their life. And for me, not only that, they were like the biggest support for me. And they taught me in a very young age that I have to be the master of my own destiny. I have to choose it because, you know, um, comfort zone is, you know, if we just stay in our very comfort zone, we fail because that's all we know. And if we learn to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation, that's when we can succeed. And if we choose something easy in life, 
um, you know, our life will be difficult in the future because that's what we've chosen for ourselves. And I think that's what it motivated me that if I have a people that family that they support me, it's me that I have to put the work on and just try to change something. I know it will be very difficult being a woman and just not many women, um, especially in Afghanistan, like it's so sad that every woman, there's so many strong women in that country. Um, and, you know, they've been in law enforcement and lawyers, uh, police officers in the military and uniform. Um, the problem is they always been silent from their own families. They always had to hide their faces when they are in the other side of um, the work zone just because they were not supported by the families and they were afraid their family would be the first person to torture them and kill them. And um, and I consider myself very lucky because the voices that I found, not many girls in Afghanistan could find their voices um, just because of what starts from a family. And as you mentioned that he was very supportive of you and, and you have a brother, right, who was also supportive, um, very much so. And I think we often see this in America where we tell our kids, hey, you can be anything. It's going to be tough, but you can do it. Your situation is even more significant, I think, because your your family had a massive sacrifice to pay because of it. And it's unlike anything Americans can wrap their heads around. Um, and we'll get into that. But the the threats and having to move constantly and, and just to make sure that you had this path. It's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to do there than when we say it here. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Nilufar, was where was the the first moment you remember aspiring to be a pilot? Um, you know, that's a very interesting question because I love that question. You know, for most of the people, when I was a child, um, I honestly did not know what the how the plane is, who can be a pilot. I always thought it you have to be just, I never saw a plane, to be honest, uh, growing up. And I never been in a plane, not commercially, not for anything. I never been in a plane. To be honest, I didn't know. I just thought you have to be a very genius person to be able to fly a plane and that, you know, fast machine. And I'm I'm not capable of doing that, uh, which is not a good. And I never advise that to any girls or boys that they never should count themselves less than what God gives them because we're all created equally. We have the same two hand brain, everything equally. We just have to use it and believe in ourselves. But which I didn't just because I grew up in a country that I always been told I'm less than anyone else just because I'm a woman. And, you know, most of the time uh, for most of the people probably in the world, they think um, when the U.S. and NATO forces came to Afghanistan, it was an invasion. I don't see it that way. I do see it that it was a freedom that was brought to Afghanistan. And I was one of those witnesses that how much it changed my life. I remember after 9-11, um, when the U.S. came to Afghanistan and we were in Afghanistan and we returned back to Afghanistan by then. And um, it was just so so fascinating that when the fighter jets were flying over Kabul and dropping bombs and I was just so fascinated by those jet flying over Kabul that my family would tell me like, there's a war going on and there's like a war and you're just like laying down here and enjoying these. The very interesting part was that I would hear their sounds and I couldn't even like, my eyes couldn't follow it. It was so fast. And I am sure there has been a woman, probably one of them has been a woman that um, I have no idea, but it really, really inspired me that how fascinated it was. And I just couldn't get my eyes off of it. And it was just something that I fall in love with to actually see a fighter jet that I never saw in my life growing up and being, I mean, like nine, 10 years old. Um, it really, really um, like triggered that in my brain that, that how much I love and um, I'm so like, it just gives you, you know, it, it gives you so much a different feeling that, you know, it's not from nowhere, you know, how much your heart and your brain like loves this. And I think that's how it started for me as well. Can you give people an idea of just how outrageous the, uh, the notion that you could go as a 10 year old girl in Afghanistan at that time and one day fly planes? How 
how insurmountable did that seem at the time? To be honest, never felt real. It never just felt real because back then, still Afghanistan, it was torn apart. It was completely a war zone. And, um, you know, it just, sometimes you can dream, like sometimes you feel like you have a dream and you wake up and that's not the reality. That's how most of the time it feels. Even up to now when, as I say, the life gets so easy, um, sometimes you you really forget if those were real moments. You Sometimes you realize maybe that was a dream that I just woke up out of it. And that's how most of the time when I just look back, close my eyes sometimes, uh, it just doesn't feel real. And you, just before we jump into your military story, uh, Nilufar, could you could you tell us what is the ethnic background of your family, the language you spoke, and what did that mean for you as a child? Well, um, Afghanistan, as everyone lived there for long enough, they know it's a very, very tribal place, very tribal place. One thing I love about America is everybody called themselves Americans. Nobody just called themselves from the state that they were born. Yeah, they might mention it that this is where I was born, but everyone mm-hmm. called themselves Americans which is the beauty of this country. And unfortunately, Afghanistan is a very tribal country that there is different tribes like Pashtun, Tajik, Kuzbak, Hazara, and every one of them has a history in Afghanistan and how they came to Afghanistan and how created the Afghanistan. My family came from a Tajik family. My entire family is Tajik and we speak Dari. Um, so, Afghanistan, like whoever is Pashtun, they think they own Afghanistan. That's where they belong. And we all came from a different part of Afghanistan. Like we came from Tajikistan and we just like left over of Tajikistan or people from Uzbek, they just left over of Uzbekistan or Hazara people are, you know, left over of Chinggis Khan and stuff like that, that they don't consider us like a real Afghans or we belong in that country. Um, that's why every time when it's the matter of power, um, when it's the matter of presidency or, you know, it's always they want to be in power. They want to have the control just because they they think they are the real um, Afghans, which they belong to Afghanistan. Yes. And then... <laughs> One other thing that came up that really struck me, can you share what it was like? I think it it must have been before 9-11, but growing up around the Taliban, just some of the the traumatic or challenging events were one of them that you faced to give people an idea of what that was like day to day. Unfortunately, it just um, up to nowadays, it just makes me very emotional even talking about it. Um, It wasn't it wasn't great, especially being a woman. Um, like one time I've been like actually twice been witness of what happened to my mother that, um, my father was working at the farm back then because that was the only job available you could do. There was no job in the country. Um, and he was an engineer also by trade, right? Yes. Um, he went to college, he graduated as civil engineer back, um, on a great time of Afghanistan before the war. And when the Afghanistan collapsed in the hand of the Taliban and the civil war and their presence, of course, everything was taken away. There was no, um, for sure, development, construction, nothing. There was no jobs. Uh, most of the people, how they could survive was um, just to go work on farms and lands and that's how you can provide for your family. And that's what my dad did. Um, just being, you know, um, all these small family back then, which I think in America is not as small, but it was me, my sister, my brother, my mom. Uh, we were at home all day long. The only person could go out was my dad and my brother when my father wasn't home. And um, unfortunately, one of those days, my sister, my older sister got sick and uh, really, really sick that um, it was very terrifying situation. And my mom couldn't couldn't really handle it, couldn't wait for my father. And I, she didn't know when my father would be home to take the child to, to that clinic or hospital. So my mom, she had to wear this burqa and just run out of the door just to get my sister to the hospital. And because of the rush and fear she had of not something would happen to my sister, she forgot to put her shoes on. She forgot to put her socks on. And uh, this is where when they got off of the the, the car and um, 
just because my mom's shows was, um, you know, like foot was showing skin. Um, she got beat up by the Taliban. They beat her up to the level that she was bleeding on her foot. And um, I remember like I wasn't with them when they came home and my mom was screaming and all she could, she had no word to say and she had like zero word to say. And I, it's like, it makes my heart in pain, like even talking about it that what is your fault of just being a woman that if you see your child is dying and you can't just take her to the hospital and that's how you get treated. And um, the other problem is if you don't have a male with you as a woman, you couldn't go out uh, no matter how much urgent a situation is. And that's how, that's how it happened to my mom that she just got so beat up just because of that one thing of, her foot was showing and she didn't have a shoes on. She just had a flip-flop on probably. And it's very painful. And um, it's the same stories. This is just one of those stories. So many people in Afghanistan struggled. I had the witness of my own friend that was taken away by force uh, from the Taliban. They just came to their house, took their daughters, killed their fathers just because they couldn't say anything. They could do anything they want. If they liked a girl, they would just go pick it up and just kill their families if they say no. Um, it's just a terrifying situation that if you live that life, you would understand how it felt. But if you haven't lived on that country under that situation, and especially now when I have seen the cobble that it collapsed in 2021, I totally could feel how people felt. Nobody run for their life the way they did. They were ready to just pass on their child just to not go through what people did go through that as a child, I remember how people were terrified. And um, it's just so heartbreaking that how many women, they just killed themselves, throw themselves off of the floors, high, you know, third, fourth floors, just to not be taken away by the Taliban. And it's just very hard, um, you know, sometimes even talking about it. It's just what is our fault? Just, you know, being a woman, um, it's not a toy that, you know, just to do whatever you want. And um, if your family just say anything, they get murdered. And that's how evil these people are. And uh, and their face is always the same and they never change. Yeah. Oh, geez. Just a quick word from our sponsor and we'll get right back to this combat story. Today's podcast is sponsored by NutriSense. That was the sound of the NutriSense biosensor that I've been wearing. NutriSense is a really helpful tool that teaches me about the food and drink choices that affect my body and how to better manage stress, sleep, think about exercise and more. I've tried other glucose monitors in the past and they just did not compare to the NutriSense system. For starters, the NutriSense app is the key that I've been looking for because it gives me a clear view of what my glucose levels are in real time, tracks my steps, I can enter my daily meals and calories and more. I used this during my episode with Jay, in fact, and could see that the coffee I drank at the beginning of the show had little effect on my glucose, which is great, but the beer I had, a lager, later on, increased my glucose, but not in a drastic way. Still, this is the kind of detail I have been looking for. To start decoding your body's messages and pave the way for a healthier life, visit NutriSense.com slash combat and get $30 off your first month and one month of board certified nutritionist support. When they ask you how you learned about NutriSense, make sure to tell them it was the Combat Story podcast. That's NutriSense.com slash combat for $30 off your first month and one month of board certified nutritionist support. And now back to this combat story. Um, I I still remember we were based out of uh, coast in uh, eastern Afghanistan and like as we would take off after we flew for maybe two minutes, there was a girls school that we would fly over many days or not directly over, but nearby. And it just reminds me reading your book that kind of before 9-11, that's the experience you had after 9-11. It's like you've got warplanes flying around, dropping bombs. Um, So it's not a a necessarily a great environment, but you are able to go to school at that point, right? You're, you're back at school with girls. Um, you have a chance for an education. Absolutely. As I mentioned before, um, for us, it completely changed our life. Not only me, there are millions of girls in Afghanistan, their life changed because before that, you know, I was 10 years old and I 
wasn't in school. I was homeschooled by my mom. Uh, she would teach us at home how to read and write. And like me, so many other girls in Afghanistan, they found a way to education. The schools start reopening. The women's uh, places start opening in every other part of the government. It took a little while, but it definitely changed the life in Afghanistan for women. And um, that's when I start going to school as well. We had to go through uh, entrance test uh, because we were all older for the grade that we supposed to go. And luckily, uh, just because of the education that my mom was providing for us at home, we were able to pass those grades that our ages were not a fit for those. Um, and we start going to school. Um, and I remember that that was the happiest moment that I finally sat in a classroom. I was among other girls that they were going to school and we had a real teacher teaching us. We had a desk and table and you know, as a child, you just feel like your wishes are granted, like you, something you wished, and that's what you got. And for us, just to go to school, I remember the feeling of the happiness that it provided for me. I couldn't even sleep a night before because I was so excited. I didn't know what it looked like. And um, it's just very, very happy moment that I finally was able to go to school. I'm going to make my kids listen to what you just said when they complain about going to school now. It's going to be great. They're going to hear this over and over. Um, so obviously, something happens that allows you to get into the to the aviation track. But just briefly, because I know you you were so eager to become a pilot. If you didn't have a chance to fly, if for whatever reason, things didn't change, what do you think you would have done with your life? What would you have studied and gone on and done? I think sometimes it's very hard even for me to think about because all I knew is, you know, as I said, as a young age, I didn't know to be a pilot. I, I did not. Sometimes I don't even know if I wouldn't fly, what else would make me happy. And I think I might have gone in a medical route um, just mm -hmm. because of a woman and in Afghanistan, uh, only a woman, a female doctor can treat a female um patient and I think that would have made my heart happy so yeah. there is women's have uh, someone else to take care of them and be help for them uh, I think that would have been but I don't think that would have been something my heart would feel for it um but I think that's that's would be the second thing I would have done yeah I'm not surprised having read your story now um so let's talk about aviation all of a sudden something happens when you are the perfect age that makes it possible for you to become a pilot. Can you talk through what that moment was like for you? What happened? Yeah, you know, sometimes when uh, opportunities just uh, keep knocking your doors. And I think uh, during that time, I just consider myself very lucky that one day me and my brother were just playing uh, chess and all of a sudden there was an advertisement in the TV that um, of course it was what the US wanted for the female in Afghanistan to be part of any organization. If it is civilian world, if it is military, uh, they wanted the females to be part of it. And that's what had happened. Um, I just saw this advertisement in the TV that they are recruiting women in any branches of the military, uh, Army or Air Force. That's what we had back then. And um, if anyone is interested, this is how they can apply. This is where they can go. And also there's a chance that if they go to the Air Force, they can also be a pilot. And that moment, you know, sometimes like when you just get on a shock that you can't even move for a few seconds. That's what had happened to me. I was like, wow, how is this even possible? Because for those that they don't know, um, Afghanistan, they, there's no civilian aviation school. There is none. The only route that you can be a pilot is if you have a family that they are rich, they can send you abroad for you know getting your license and be a pilot overseas. Or if you're joining um, the Air Force. And that's how you get to be a pilot. There's two choice. So the one choice was no, no for me. And this was the only and first choice I ever had. And I remember I was shouting and being so excited and everybody <laughs> just kind of ignored me at that point. Like, what are you talking about? Nobody really took me serious until uh, my father came home and I told him that. And I say, there's no other chances for me beside this one route. 
And, you know, for every mother, it's very terrifying for their daughters that they know what they can go through in a society which is so male dominated, what my daughter can go through and what it will be and the risk. And she all the thing she thinks about is um, the, you know, negative stuff that doesn't allow her to um, allow her child to pursue this route. And um, again, when I share that to my family and my father, especially, he really supported me on that. And he said, I do believe you. If you want, that's what you want to do. I will not say no to it. You just have to go and make me proud. And that's when it all started. When um, I had my brother, he went with me to recruiting uh, office and um, he just accompanied me the whole way. And um, I remember the day that we went to that office, the general that was in charge of this uh, recruitment uh, process. And of course, there are other soldiers that was working for them. So they kind of guided us there because we were like kind of special cases that was so new. Um, it was like the second group of women to just start recruiting, being recruited. And I remember the face of this person was so much hate that, first of all, they were looking at my brother like he's a bad person or he's selling out his his sister or something that why because in afghanistan if you're in a military you're either have no parents you're someone that you have no other way to support yourself and probably you're not a good girl or something that's how they would view you and and my brother would just ignore it. He would just stand with me the same place until my turn came. So I finally entered the general's office. And the so funny part is he was just drinking tea and he was just watching cartoon. I'm like, goodness. Oh, my God. Like, that was a very bad impression of him. And first of all, he just looked at me. And I was very young back then. Uh, like, my daughter, you don't have any, like, you don't have a father or mother to support you. And like, what are you doing here? And I just look at him. I was like, what are you doing here? If it is so shameful for me to wear the uniform, are you ashamed as well to have it on? And it's just, he had no other word to tell me. He just signed a paper and we walked out. <laughs> How old were you then? Um, I was like right after high school, like 18 I was wow. 18 because this started like right I got uh, out of the school and uh, it was just very heartbreaking that the first impression I got is yeah. like, that's how they view me, that I don't have appearance or I'm someone from the street that I just want to be in the military. And uh, I'm glad that he had no response to what I said, because if you wear the uniform because you're a male, it's a pride for you. And if I wear it as a woman, I have to be ashamed that I wear the uniform it didn't just make sense to my little brain back then i guess <laughs> and it wouldn't be the last time obviously you had to deal with very similar experiences which is terrible if i one of the questions that really came to mind especially at this point right so you you've seen the advertisement you go to the recruiting station you sign the papers your brother's with you your parents are supporting you if you had known how tough it was going to be on you and your family over the next 10 years, would you still have done that? When I look back, yes, I would have. You know, as I said at the beginning, the comfort comfort zone is very, very good place to everyone to be. And of course, growing up in Afghanistan in that situation, I never expected anything easy. I expected to be risk and I expected to be you know, fears and hates and people that would stop you to the level that I would see that my brother get shot or it will affect their lives. That's not, I never imagined that part, but I was happy that I started it that route because if I didn't, I didn't know where my life would be now, where my family life would be. It wasn't easy at all by any mean. Um, but according to your question, if I have, would have done it, yes, I would. Wow. Oh, such a hard, hard decision. Um, okay. I'm very interested here. Can you, can you talk us through the experience? So you've signed up, you're in the pipeline and there's obviously a lot of things that have to happen for you to actually get into the cockpit. And one thing that really struck me was it felt so similar to how, how I felt when I was 
starting out in the process and like, oh, I have to go to medical. If if they find something wrong with my eyes or something, I'm done. And now I can't be a pilot. Um, if I pass, if I don't pass this test, I'm done. You know, I have to compete against all these people. And I think it doesn't matter where you are. Something about aviation just does that to you. But could you talk us through what was it like for training to get you into the cockpit? Yeah, absolutely. It definitely was a very long process, especially we were the second group of females that was going through um, the military training. So at the beginning, after I got recruited, all the paperwork was done. So we were a total of 21 female, if I'm not mistaken. We were 21 and we had to go um, to uh, a boot camp. Like that's what they would say in America. And that's where we were. The great part was that it was just a female uh, place. So it wasn't mixed with the male or that was the time that we didn't have so much struggle because we were among each other. We were females, all the, you know, like our, the officers and, uh, the training officers, they were all U S military, uh, British and from other NATO forces that we, um, just, that's where we were like, just in our place, the only time that we would go and just be mixed with the other male uh, co-workers and male candidate uh, was when we were going for uh, shooting and range and stuff. Uh, but other than that, I don't remember a bad experience there just because we were not directly um, like dealing with men's uh, in that part of the training. After we got graduated and uh, we all become second lieutenant, that was the time that if we got a good grade during the training and, you know, when I we were in school um, to be an officer and um, that's where we got elected that how we can proceed for the next level where we get um, selected and where we would end up working. And um, because they were told us like if when we were in training that if you do good, that's what you get uh, selected for pilot training. I remember like I would work so hard. I would sometimes at night, uh, we would just hide a little flashlight uh, under our bed. So when they made the dorms dark and they told everyone to go to sleep. So we would just pull out. Uh, it was one of me and one of my other friend that she really wanted to be a pilot as well. And uh, we would just pull that flashlight and try to, you know, study and memorize as much as we can and get a good scores. Um, and when we graduated, uh, that was the next step. Uh, we were told these groups going to the Air Force, you, there is a process that you have to go through. And this half of the class is going to go work for um, Ministry of Defense and then different uh, positions. I remember the first day that we, our bus just arrived in the Afghan Air Force in Kabul. Of course, that was so new for them. Uh, it was so new in 2000. I think it was 2010. Um, it was so new for them that there was almost no females there. We walked in there and the, we arrived at the lunchtime, unfortunately, and they dropped dropped us by the defect. And we just went in there and everybody is just like staring at us. Like we came from a completely, you know, a different um I don't know, like completely a different place, like aliens or something. It just felt like very weird. Um, unfortunately. And then um, I remember like, we just had to ignore them. We just like ignore them and walk, you know, with the heads up that we are officers and we are same as you guys. And if we are women, you just have to get used to it that uh, we are women. I think for the first uh, day and the second day, it was so weird because everybody would just walk out with their head toward us. Like they couldn't even believe it because People that were in the Air Force or into the military, they didn't really knew what was going on, how the females got in here and the whole the process because we were on the training and nobody really knew where we were. Um, so it was like a very mm -hmm. weird situation until we get all of these people to chill and relax and, um, you know, like we are here now. So you just have to get used to it. Um, so the process of just getting used to, um, I mean, going through the medical, which was the hardest part, I mean, the first process was the English. Uh, none of us, none of the girls knew how to speak English because we were not taught in school. You didn't know? Knew I before? did not knew. 
No, I did not knew any English. Um, wow. So it was super, super new for me. And um, I I had no idea. Um, I didn't know a single word of English. I never spoke English and I never been taught really in, in school, um, like to the level that a person can really communicate. And the first thing for us was that we had to be in a level, a grade that we are able to start a pilot training because in aviation, everything is on English. Everything is based on knowing English, uh, speaking English, writing English, and understanding because all our instructor would be Americans. And of course, pilot training, everything is taught in English. Um, and I remember like that back then they told us like if you guys, because we had to go through the English classes and stuff. Um, so we came to the Air Force and we had to go um to Kiltic, which is a place owned, uh, it was like a military, U.S. military building uh, into the Afghan Air Force that the U.S. personnel was living there, um, the officers, and uh, that's where we would go live as well, uh, daily basis at night to just get that full, um, I mean, English training and to be ready in six months. Um, so that was the deal. And we were told if you don't complete it within a six months, then you have to wait for another uh, I think it was a year or so to be uh, able to start the next pilot training. And it was very, very difficult for us. It wasn't only one thing to deal with, which is the medical. Of course, that's another nightmare that every pilot had to go through if I'm not good enough. Uh, English was another thing for us, uh, especially coming from a background of none of your family speaks English. We had to go to Celtic and um, we were lucky that we lived with American on the base um, like all day long, night, day. All we could hear is English, start learning little by little, start watching movies and going to school all day long for English. And one thing is just learning English. Another thing is the slang words that was so hard that until now, I still, I still can't get it. It's just so <laughs> hard. It's so difficult. And uh, for those that English is their own native language, they might not consider it that way, but it's definitely a very, very right. difficult um, language just because every other dictionary in the world is like small. English is like so big and there's so many words and just means one, one thing. Um, but um, so to make the story short, um, we had to go through the English classes first. The same time that we are learning English, we had to go through the medical examination um, to see if we are learning English. And if we don't have the other qualification, then we better just stop and pursue another route. And this is what happened is that we start going every day. We were scheduled to go to the medical building in the Air Force and start going through the whole you know, medical um, uh, procedure, I mean, uh, like whatever needs to be done to be qualified. And unfortunately, I remember we were so happy that here we are, we're going through the English classes, we're going to get the English down, this is going to be the medical will be over. We never thought about what can go wrong, because I knew I was a healthy person. I knew until nowadays, I never ever been diagnosed with one single problem in my life. So I was, I, w I just believed myself that there's nothing wrong with me. Why should I, have, this should be an issue that I, it would stop me. I never had it in my mind. And um, when we went to the Air Force and through the medical, unfortunately, so many girls would walk out crying that one would get disqualified because they were short. Uh, some were color blinded. Some couldn't, I mean, their eyes had a problem and just for, for a problem that they just wanted to create and cause an issue for that woman that they, they would be disqualified. And, and these are, this is Afghan medical personnel, not, not the U S medical folks, right? No, this was the Afghan uh, yeah. medical uh, because our medical was still uh, under the control of uh, Afghans, like the same way that we had to get, uh, you know, go through the everything that to start with Afghan because we were still in Afghanistan. We were still part of the Afghan military and we had a hospital in Afghan Air Force. Um, so if we have a hospital, we have a doctors, we have a chief doctors. Why did we have to go somewhere else? And that's what Americans just believed. And they were like, okay, this is the next process and this is going to be done here. 
And it was so unfortunate. It, um, most of the girls, uh, unfortunately, you know, they disqualified just because, um, you know, they were shorter, probably the colorblind issues that was tested and stuff like that. For most of us, uh, it was very heartbreaking that the moment that I remember just one girl got qualified, just one between all of us. And just one girl got qualified. And the next thing I see is like, it's three of us left and I see my report and I, it shows I have a heart problem, which is the first number, first thing that they can, it can disqualify you from pilot training. And I just stare at the paper and I start, I couldn't stop my tears. It was so heartbreaking that all these happiness that we had to go through all these times that I thought. I got a step closer. I got a one step closer. This is the second step. And we're almost there. There is now the new issue. I remember that day I was so upset and my whole body was like so much in pain that I had no control over it. There was nothing I could I could do about it. I went home and I shared that with my parents about I got disqualified with the heart issue and never in my life I complained about a heart issue. What is going on? So my parents, they took me to a completely um, like a civilian hospital and uh, the results showed everything was normal, like completely normal. There was nothing wrong with me. And then I came back and I knew if I would go by myself to the Afghan doctors, they would tell me, you know, that's wrong. That's not true. We have a more modern technology and stuff like that. I was very blessed that... Um, Back then, uh, the Celtic, where I was learning English, um, the the person in charge, it was a um, U.S. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and he completely changed my life on that. Colonel Sossman, whoever knows him, uh, he was just a great leader and a great person. I went to his office and I said, there's no other ways left for me. Um, I was disqualified for having a heart issue, and I took... Uh, I went to the hospital, the civilian hospital, and their results show something different. And he just looked at the two papers. And I'm sure then they knew how much corruption is going on and everything is against women. That might be another game that they are playing. Um, so he said, I need to make sure myself before I go there and I be proven wrong. Um, so the same day, he took me to the French hospital, which was an American site in the base. And they did exactly the same um, hard uh, tasks for me. And the result came positive. I mean, uh, sorry, like completely, oh, I'm okay. Yeah. And uh, that result gave him the reason to walk in with me to the chief doctors, Afghan chief doctor. When we went to the office and he showed the results that I want to know what is going on. She has two results that it shows she's completely fine. And your result shows that she has a heart problem. He completely, completely changed his words. Like he said, I don't know. Maybe she has um, took some kind of medication that day. That's why her heart uh, shows like that. And it was so upsetting that to see if you just let these people go, that's how much they can destroy your life. And if you fight it and you don't give up, um, that's when the win is. And that's when you never fail. And I think... One thing I carried through life that, you know, it's so important that giving up is always a rebuilt of regrets. And this is what I believe, that if I give up, I know until nowadays I would have regret what happened for the rest of my life. And I'm so happy I did that. And I knew I was fine. <laughs> I, I just have to imagine not many other girls that age in Afghanistan would have had the nerve to go and like march into the colonel's office and plead your case. Did the other girls end up getting, um, did their cases get reviewed? Do you know? Unfortunately, I think it did uh, because, you know, what I did, I wanted other girls to do the same. Uh, but unfortunately, two of us just got qualified because the rest, um, they couldn't prove that it was it wasn't, I guess, true. Yeah. Unfortunately, they just got, uh, I remember like one of the girls, 
um, her arms are so, so short or the legs were short and stuff like that. And they just got disqualified for that. Uh, but it was very heartbreaking that all the men's in our classes or whoever came the same time with us uh, for pilot training, they all got accepted. There was not even one single yeah. man got disqualified by the doctors. And it was almost 95% of the girls, they all got disqualified, um, which was sad. <laughs> and you made it through the English on your first pass, right? The English training at Celtic? Yes. Um, so the English was um, after I passed uh, the medical. So I knew the last thing last for me is the English. And I had to take the like get this score to be able to go and start my bio training. And I remember the day of the test. I was so nervous, like every test I took in my life. Like it's so it's very nerve wracking for me. Like I never been a good uh, test taker. Like I always get so nervous. I always like just kill myself over it. Like, oh my God, what if, what if? And um, that was another day that I knew if I, I, if I wouldn't score, if one score is less than what the requirement is, I have to wait another year for that. And I don't know where my life would be in one year. Um, so luckily, after I took the test, I exactly scored above what the requirement was. And um, that was it. And that day I completely took a deep breath like I knew this is the time like I can actually go and start my pilot training yes and and again you mentioned you were kind of on the base for those six months like living there when you transition to tr pilot training is this where you have to go and live at home and then shuttle back and forth to the base no uh so no, we were okay. Kabul um Kabul was the main base that we went through the Celtic which was English in the Afghan Air Force so after that everything was handed to the US military and uh US contractors so we didn't have to deal with anything else um so the base was in Shindand uh in Afghanistan there was another base that was created like far away from Kabul with no distraction um it was like so much more flat surface like not higher elevations and stuff uh what it was very close to iran border where we were and um that's where they start building um uh, the first time that they were training afghan pilots inside afghanistan and that's how um the u.s military created that base in uh, shindan so this way all the afghans can be trained inside afghanistan without coming to the u.s for pilot training Got it. okay so you go through your training there how long does that take and what do they start you training on um, so we started, first of all, we all went through the IFS, which is the initial uh, flight training that um, we just do a couple flights. And we get after that, um, the group of people that were in pilot training, they get selected who goes to rotary wing and who goes to fixed wing. And um, so after that, we just got, you know, our group, our class got selected, like half of the class or can't remember how many of them got selected to go to the uh, helicopter training. And uh, we got elected for a fixed wing. And it took like uh, one and a half year to go through the pilot training. And um, it was a tough and rough one and a half year for sure. Um, so I was the only female in the whole uh, class of mine. And it was all the male colleague, which... It's so sad to say that, but none of them really liked me. And all they could do is to just destroy my confidence um, that I was a female and this wasn't my place and I would fail. I will crash a plane. And that's all what the females would do. Um, and I am forever thankful for my instructors that um, it was all American military in the U.S., uh, like, Pilots uh, were all um, U.S. pilots, and most of them were retired military, Air Force, most of them contractors. And they made me like really work hard to just prove myself that I belong here and I have to build my confidence to just not. I came so far, right? I came so far. I fought through all these uh, barriers to get here, and you shouldn't let these classmate of yours to just silence you and tells you how good or how bad you are. And that made me that I start building my confidence because until then, I think the words and where I grew up, it really affected me that I was a female and I wasn't good enough. And I had to start building my confidence 
And every day that they would tell me I'm not good enough, I had to prove them wrong. I had to work probably two times harder than them just to prove myself that I can do it. Um, So just because we were started inside Afghanistan, I didn't get lucky enough to fly T-6s. So I fly uh, like 182s. That's how we got started. And we did our IFS training with the 182s. Um, And that's how I did my solo as well. (laughs) So yeah, a few things I'd love to hear. One is I, I would ask if you could share the story about the challenges that you faced trying to learn how to land. I think it was touch and go landings and landings right at first and how you kind of uncovered what the root cause problem was. Um, Yeah. Unfortunately, it was so sad, um, you know, for me to come in from a country that I wasn't, I wasn't even allowed to drive a car, um, you know, drive a car or do anything in the society besides just work in the house. Um, you know, it was so hard, first of all, to find the voice that you supposed to have when you do, when you go through pilot training, it's not yeah. an easy process. It's a difficult process, even for me to be in a, you know, uh, learn it in a completely a different language, a second language and not be able to completely express yourself. And at the beginning, it was so hard for me. I was so disappointed at myself and I didn't know what is wrong, why I can't get it. So every time I would come to land, I wouldn't be able to land a plane. I would flare so high because I wouldn't see the end of the runway. And every time I would flare high and I would, you know, just do a hard landing and stuff like that. And um, it was very, very hard for me. Um, and I was very upset and I was so upset and I was like really killing myself over it that why this is not happening. And, um, you know, like every time it's, it's so important how good an instructor you have and everyone, yeah. everyone can be an instructor, everyone can teach, but it depends what method you can use for a certain student. You have to find the root of the problem first before explaining the next, the next process. And I think for me, most of the instructors couldn't find the root of the problem. And one of my instructors finally found the root of problem. They were like, can you really see? Well, I was like, no, this problem is in front of me. and I can't even see the end of the runway. So we start putting using the cushions uh, under my seat because the problem with 182 is you're sitting like so low and this big prop is like right in front of you. And uh, it was so high, especially like flaring. I was not able to even see the whole runway. And after like recognizing this is what the main issue is, and I needed a cushion to fix the whole problem of landing. Um, I remember once we got that problem fixed after that, I could totally land a plane fine. And I think since then I realized, um, you know, how a very literal problem can cause a huge problem. And I was getting very, uh, I mean, not discouraged. I was getting so mad at myself that what if these guys are right? What if whatever they say is true? I'm just a woman and I might not be able to do it. And after that, I just broke that in my brain that no matter what, you should never let this negativity to build up in your mind. The words, what do they say? It should just make you stronger and you just have to prove them by your actions. And um, it was it was a, a time for me, like when we got that right and I start building my confidence again and um, getting excited uh, after that. Was the first time... I have to imagine the first time you actually went up in the aircraft, like with hands on the controls or the first time you soloed, were those pretty amazing moments for you? Absolutely, it was. The funny part is, you know, most people just get so terrified. The solo flight is like absolutely terrifying <laughs> flight for a person that always remember that flies with an instructor and you always like, OK, if I do something wrong, the instructor will save my life, save the plane. And um, I remember the time that uh, when I was doing my solo, uh, one of the um, colonels, actually, um, he was the squadron commander of uh, the base in the American side. He uh, flew with me. And after we, uh, we he got out of the plane, he took his wing off of his chest and he stuck it in mine. He's like, I believe on you. You will return this for me. And I mean... That moment, maybe it's like something simple for most people. For me, it just 
brought the hope of like how much this person believe on me and he knows I will do well. And it's especially it comes from the squadron commander and he's a lieutenant colonel and he is believing on me that much. And it gives me the feeling of like, like my dad tells me that he has a fate on me and I will never disappoint him. And he was like, I know you will return this back to me. And I think that that was a very great start. Somebody gives you that much confidence that you are good enough. You can do this. And I remember the time that I just, the plane just lifted off and we start, I mean, like I started uh, making my turns and being on a downwind. It felt so much great. I almost felt like someone was just right on sitting on my right side. And I don't know where that came from. I felt so comfortable and I felt so much in ease more than the time that I had an instructor with me because wow. of course the instructor would yell at you, start screaming, <laughs> talking, start talking. It was such a, I mean, relieving moment for me, which I can't like forget it. Um, I still remember until nowadays that it was the best time. Like I realized I wasn't, I wasn't really scared the funny part is that I always felt like I knew, like I looked on my right side, it was completely empty, but I felt someone was there with me that I don't understand like why I got that feeling, but it definitely, definitely was a great uh, moment, especially when everything went great. Um, the pilots that they just, uh, my classmate that they told me she's going to crash and she's not going to do well on her solo. How can you let her to, you know, go by herself? and the same person did horribly. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> went off the runway, went to the grass and did not stop <laughs> playing there. And he made a mistake of taxiing from the ground, pulling in front of someone else. It was completely a show he created. And I just, I was just, I just laughed at that situation. I was like, how come this all returns back? You know, like, I'm so glad that it went so well. And I think that was the time. Um, it really kept building my confidence and I knew I could do it. I just need to believe on myself and the people that believes on me, my instructors, those that they have a fate with me, they know that I can do it. They believe on me. And I had to work hard just because of those people, not only for myself, because of them. Um, and then, and I think that is something in my brain. Every time I went through the struggle, it kept me motivated and it kept me going for yeah. sure. And you, you know, it's, you kind of overcome another hurdle there with people putting you down and you're not going to make it and you, and you make it through the flight training. And obviously you're, I think as you describe it, the command, especially the NATO side recognizes this is the first female pilot. Uh, the first female Afghan pilot. And so there's more publicity around it, which I think being the first at anything has to be difficult. And you probably wouldn't wish it on a lot of people. And no. th the publicity that comes with it is one thing that can be difficult. But especially in your situation in Afghanistan with your family, it makes it all the harder. Is, th is it at the end of that training in Shindan where you get dunked and the picture is taken of you? Well, that picture is exactly when I did my solo flight because okay. like when you're only female and there's so many men's like hundreds and hundreds of men in one base and you're the only female that everybody and everybody is watching you if you're going to fail, if you want to crash, if you will do good. So everybody's just waiting there. Of course, among all those men's, I'm not going to say all of them. There has been some good men's in there too. Um, most of them, they were just there to make me feel ashamed, make me look bad, uh, show me to the society that I was a horrible person. I was going against the religion. I was going against the culture. And um, it's completely, that's how they viewed me. Not the respect of, I just wear the uniform to serve my country. I'm flying the same plane as other men are trying to do. And all I do is I want to prove a point that not only I can fly a plane. I can wear the uniform. This can be also done in such a dominated male country that a female can still work. And this has to change. We live in this century that all the worlds are thinking about going to space and creating another life and, you know, great things. 
why we are still stuck in a very, very negative minded and a very old days that people a hundred years ago probably thought like that. And not many of them thought like this. And unfortunately, when I was uh, doing my solo, as most of the pilots knows, um, they just throw you in a thing of water, in a pool of water after you completely uh, complete your solo flight. And I was unaware of it. This is going to happen. And I saw because there was like no other females. So one of the British girls, uh, she was, a, uh, I think she was a lieutenant and the other one uh, was American. And of course they were tall. Um, they had a hat on. They completely, because they were so tall and, you know, um, I, I was little, to be honest. And uh they just grabbed me to throw me in a pool of water just to be respected because I was a Muslim girl. And um, those girls, they were girls to do that. Unfortunately, the moment that I thought it was the happiest day for me and, you know, it was just a great achievement and everybody was here to watch me and I succeeded. Not many male in my country thought like that, especially those that they were in the base. Um, they took a pictures from each different angles that those were American males um, that they hugged me and they throw me in the pool of water to baptize me. That's how they actually draw a picture in the society. And I didn't even walk out of the base um, that it was all published, like all through the social media. And sometimes in those third world countries, the social media is so big. It's like a CNN um, of Afghanistan. Um, it was all over the social media and Facebook that this is an Afghan woman. She's being baptized by American soldiers. And the society, they don't know anything about solo. They don't know about what a costume is after doing your solo to be thrown in the water. Mm -hmm. But what they know is, Again, the religion that, okay, she, she's being baptized. She's, they're changing her religion and stuff like that. And, you know, for a country like our country, that it's so very religious. It's just still everything they do is, talks about religion. It's all about whatever they believe that it's right. And this is something that triggers them very, very, very fast. And this is what they found and they put it in the, in the social media. And that's when the society, my own extended family, found out where I was, what I was doing. And not only to be proud of what I was doing, they were thinking we ashamed them. How come I am the situation that they draw for the society? That's what they believed. No matter how much I was trying to yell and scream and say, hey, no, I am a pilot. I wear the uniform. I serve my country. This is the costume of doing what they do after solo. They don't believe any of those. They just believed what they saw in social media. And um, out, most of them out of ignorance, most of them out of being uneducated or just close-minded. Um, unfortunately, the moment that was my happiest moment, um, they turned it to a very sad and and very upsetting um, situation for me and my family. Yeah. And we didn't even mention that while you're at this training, your extended family thinks that you're at university at school, right? So that your family doesn't have this daughter who is training in the military and put them at risk. And now all of a sudden, something that was like you're, you're inducted into this pilot custom that should be a really fun experience has turned into threats to your family. So it's just such a terrible experience. Can you take us, Nilufar, to the first time you fly a combat mission? Like, do you remember what that was? Um, well, the first time, um, I remember like when I actually got my wings and I was, I was actually a pilot that I could fly a mission in my country and go serve my country. I remember it was a very proud moment for myself because I made it through a hell to get there. <laughs> and yeah. I was proud that it happened. And I was stationed in Kabul. My couple first missions were with uh, my uh, like mentors, my American uh, mentors that they were like in the same uh, squadron with us. So the first couple missions were with them just to get more experience and qualification that we're okay, good to go. And then we would go fly like to Afghans in the same plane. I remember it was very 
I mean, at the same time, I was a very happy and proud officer that walk around and I knew I'm doing a mission and a good thing for my country. At the same time, it was so terrifying that I didn't know who was around me today, tomorrow, they will shoot me. Even walking through the flight line, soldiers that they can go like brainwashed in two seconds by the Taliban, by, you know, extremists. And um, like that happened in the past. And it was sad that I would see, like, I would always have to walk around with a gun with me, uh, which is very upsetting that you don't want to arm someone else because my, I took a fate that I just want to serve my country and fly a plane, not to carry a gun that to be afraid of my own life or to arm someone else if something happened. And um, there is a couple um, stories that it, it just, still like brings so much happiness to my heart that as a female, uh, I remember like in Afghan Air Force, uh, when I started, I got my wing and I stopped flying missions in Afghanistan, they put in a law that a woman is not able to carry HR missions, which is very heartbreaking. Why I cannot do HR missions? Is it okay if I do it? Sorry, sorry, Neil Far, just for people listening, human remains, HR in terms of like a, a dead body from you know, somebody wounded or, or sorry, somebody killed in action. Absolutely. And, you know, that was our job just because we had a plane to go and uh, bring them from another places that they got uh, killed or injured. And we had to carry it from that one plane that, you know, like we just had the caravans that we used for Afghan Air Force um, to do these missions or carry ammunition or if there's somebody there because there was a still war in the country up north. Um, it was still a war going on in the country. Maybe Kabul felt safe, but most of the places in Kabul were not safe. And I remember like I um, back then, actually, I, I think I was already an aircraft commander and we were supposed to go to Boston, no, sorry, Bastion. Yep. And uh, Bastion, which is, uh, they call it Helmand province. Um, that place was usually like a British, um, was actually mainly based in there. And then when they left, it was all uh, controlled by Afghans. And I was supposed to just go bring some personals from their uh, military staff. And that was that was the day that I had to go do that mission. And I remember halfway, we got a call from our squadron commander that he's telling me to return back because that what we supposed to do, it changed to an HR mission. And as a woman, of course, I'm not allowed to do that. And I have to return back to the base halfway. And I had to, um, he had to let someone else go. A male pilot has to go and do it. And it was very upsetting for me that why is that? And why this has to be part of it? Like, because I'm a woman, I get emotional and I would crash a plane. Um, I remember like my co-pilot back then, he's like, oh, we got a call. We have to return. So you can't do this. And I just pretended I couldn't hear him. I turned the radio down and we just proceeded uh, on our way and we went there. And once we got there, I remember the the nurses and uh, when they brought the body to the plane and they were like more worried than my squadron commander that they will get in trouble. The co-pilot was disagreeing with me that he's not doing this. He's going to lose his wing because I'm not allowed to do this. And here it is, the body is waiting there and they're just um, fighting over if I'm allowed to do this or not. And I just told them, this is what they got. They don't have anything else. They have no one else to send because all the planes are all over uh, else. And if they want to do it, they can do it. And I told my co-pilot that if anything happened, I take the blame because I do want to do this. What is the point? I'm not disrespecting the body. I'm not going, uh, touching the body. Uh, the body is in the cafe and they're going to put it in the back of plane. You go help them to put it back there. And I would just fly the plane to get there. Um, and I told them, if you don't want to do it, I can fly this plane solo and I can go back to Kabul. And according to so much negotiation we had, finally I went and, um, we just took the body and we start flying back to Kabul. And when we landed, there was um, a soldier waiting for us in the flight line. He's like, the squadron commander is waiting for you. You just have to show up to his office. And I was like, oh, oh, I know what's going on. So 
I just walked into him and I told him I did what it seemed right to me. Do you think it was fair? Like, you know, I just, because I'm a woman, I'm not allowed to do this. And the mission was done successfully. There was nothing wrong with it. And I remember like, he just laughed at me and he just said, good job. And I just left the office. I was expecting he's going to take my wing and it says you completely broke the law and you're not able to fly anymore or just, you know, keep me away from flying for a while. And that moment, it changed. From that moment, I was able to do as much as the missions that I could do, as many bodies that I could bring, I could. And um, it just took one step to change it. And if I would just take what they put in there in the book for me, just because since I came to the Air Force and start flying, they would create it that law. And it would be easy to take it away from that book as well. And um, and I'm glad I did that. And I'm proud yeah. of it. I love that. That's such a good story. Um, and did they change? Did they overturn that law? Um, they did. So since then, That's cool. there was no restriction for us if we could do it or not. The funny part is that the Kazavak missions were completely okay. Like if I could uh, do a Kazavak, you know, there was very, very bad situation because I could see that person screaming. I could see that person holding his stomach with his stuff out. And I was like, that is more heartbreaking and upsetting. Yeah. How come you allow me to do that? But for the body, just because I'm a woman and being a woman in a presence of a dead body, it's disrespectful. This is very upsetting. And um, yeah, since then, there was no restriction. <laughs> you know, as you tell the story in the book, it doesn't seem like you end up having many friends who are men pilots in your unit. Um, when I was in Afghanistan in our aviation unit, we had one female officer. So I was the company commander. One of our platoon leaders was a woman. Um, she was a West Point grad, phenomenal pilot. When she she had had a baby like three months before deploying. So she came over there, left her baby in the U.S., oh. was with a new group of people. Um, and we had some pilots who initially didn't want to fly with her very much the way you describe it, which is very sad. But by the end of the deployment, I, I would say almost without any exception, all of our guys loved her. They really, like everybody wanted to fly with her. It That doesn't sound like what happened with you. Like you, you ended up having a challenging experience with most of the men throughout your time, it sounded like. Unfortunately, yes. And it was very heartbreaking because... Um, when I would show up in the morning um, to my duty and I had to come to work with the civilian clothes, uh, completely hide my face, my personality, who I was to the society to just survive and get to work. And I would go, I would walk into the office and I would see the board. My name was with other pilots and I would see who I was flying with and what time I was flying with and what I would be doing. And then I would go to the office to change to my uniform. And as soon as I would walk out, I would see the names are changed on the board. The name is empty and there's no one else is like, they took their name off of that. And it would break my heart that why they would do that. And, and then there was a time I got used to it. As I say, there was um, some of the older generation in Afghanistan, believe it or not, they were so much more uh, respectful and they really, really respected me for what I done and what I have proven and what I had actually, I was there to do. And they knew me, respect me for who I was as a human and not because I was a woman. And uh, most of them, especially one of them, that he was such a great person and um, he would be volunteer every time. He's like, don't worry. If he doesn't want to fly, I'm there to fly. Yeah. He was like the same age as my father and he would fly with me. Most of them, they were ashamed of how come we get order from a female. If she's in charge, I don't want to get order from her or they would change their name. Or the other one is like, why would I fly with her? Because everyone else would look down on me that she's in charge of me. Stuff, whatever negativity that they had on their mind, which was very upsetting for me at that time. They didn't want to do that. And it's it's sad that I say it because it never changed. Um, but I was very like happy. Yeah thankful for the people that um, not all of them were like that. There have been a couple of great men and co-workers that they didn't care. They were there to, you know, 
fly with me just because who I was and yeah. I was good at my job. And I was there exactly why they were there. And you alluded to how you had to get to work, like um, civilian clothes, covering yourself, driven by a family member. Often your family is moving houses because of the threats against you and, and them. Um, your sister, I think at one point is kicked out of out of the house of her husband. She doesn't get to see her child anymore. All of this is so that you can continue to pursue this dream. And it's very hard to wrap our heads around because when we deploy from the U.S. and we're over in Afghanistan, we live on the base, we walk to work, we fly, we come back, we're safe. You fly, you come back, and you have to then go and live out in this society that doesn't want to see you as who you really are. So it just adds a whole nother level of, of challenge to all of this. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, though, was... When you think of some of the more challenging missions that you went on, Nilufar, do are there any that come to mind from, you know, in terms of maybe like um, a difficult flight environment, a difficult mission, just based on where you had to go, the, I don't know, maybe the, the weather, the enemy, anything come to mind? You know, unfortunately in Afghanistan, uh, most people that flew, it wasn't only like you fly and you enjoy flying and you are definitely having fun of doing your job the same time as, you know, as a pilot, we are always concerned about what if something goes wrong and what mm -hmm. if we were flying a plane that it was not pressurized. We had to fly high just because of the mountains elevation in Afghanistan. And the next thing is, even if we would fly high, we wouldn't just because we didn't have an oxygen. And uh, we couldn't fly low just because every time we were afraid we would get shot um, because most of the time the bad people, Taliban, they would hide in the mountains and they would they would target you with the RPG in two seconds. And that was like the most terrifying situation for us. And especially up north, um, like one of those times, I remember like um, you just mentioned that uh, we had uh, an intel, and that morning, um, all of us was sitting on on the room for the briefing, and they were talking about um, the ISIS was up north, and you know, and the sad part was, they said, "Oh, we can't afford to lose more pilots because we had a couple of pilots. They already got assassinated, and um, they just got killed. Just getting out of their doors in the house, they just got." Sh shot on their head and it was like all over newspapers and it was very upsetting to see that because I knew those pilots personally myself and they were male I'm not even talking about females like what they would do to them and my most fear was that what if our plane goes down I am afraid that I would I would always carry a civilian clothes. So if something goes wrong, we would be able to just change and run away and, you know, go somewhere in the village or, you know, nobody can recognize who I was, um, which is very upset to think about that not only you are afraid of what the plane can do and what can go wrong. I was more afraid of what if I get caught by the Taliban and if our plane, because we it was a single engine and, um, where we were flying, nowhere in there, it felt safe because we didn't know um, what and when somebody can shoot at us. And a couple of times we had most of the pilots and including our own plane that there was, it wasn't a um, heavy RPGs or anything, just a gun that shot in the wings and uh, it didn't, thank God it didn't hit the fuel tanks, but um, you would not even realize that uh, we kind of like got used to it. Even the hard situation never felt like difficult situation for us. Um, it just felt normal because every day we would fly, we had that anxiety and the feeling of being prepared for what can go wrong. And I think just thinking about that, I think every day was the same kind of thing. And um, it was just our every day that we would just get up and fly the mission um, like that. And can you tell the story? I think if I got the name right, Sergeant Muhammad. Yes. <laughs> so, oh goodness, one. he was. He definitely. Um, I mean, up to now, when I just think about, you know, when you ask me if I regret anything, um, I wouldn't, because when I think about maybe there's something small thing that I would think it's very small, maybe it changed someone's life. 
um, again, you know, like there was so much Afghan soldiers, they would get um, hurt and shot and, you know, with the mines or in a face to face fight with the Taliban. Um, so our job, again, had to go to those places and bring those soldiers and who got hurt and back to Kabul, where there was a better medical treatment and a hospitals to be treated. And um, I remember when we just landed and um, I think it was Helmand again, uh, because that was like the place that it was always never peace. Always there was like war going on there. And um, they brought the ambulance and uh, our plane was small and we didn't have the place for so many of the Kazakh to sit there because we always had to carry one nurse with them as well. Um, and I remember like when they brought the ambulance and they brought two um, soldiers that they really got hurt like bad and they needed immediate attention. And there was another one, Sergeant Muhammad, and he lost one of his eyes um, and he was screaming. The other ones were so hurt that I think they were just numb. They didn't even feel anything and they were not screaming. This person, like when they said, okay, that's, I think that's all you guys carry. We have to wait for the next plane to carry the the other ones um, to Kabul. I remember like he was uh, screaming. He was uh, screaming on the door. He was screaming on the ambulance. He was knocking the ambulance door that he just going to die. He's going to be die here and nobody will take care of him. Nobody will send him. And they thought it's just an eye and um, which is everything you have, like your yeah. eye. How come that cannot be something serious? And he was so upset and so, I mean, I, it's so hard for me to even describe how he felt at that moment that he will be dead and nobody will ever even think of him and um, save him. And when I just say, no, he can just sit at the end of the plane. It's okay. Even if he sits on the floor, I think he heard my voice. He heard that there was a woman. He couldn't see me. He heard it was a woman that was trying to get him there. And I, I just forced him to put him in that plane because I knew that was the day that there was no other plane coming there. And um, I didn't know how he would be until tomorrow. And um, luckily, we were able to get him on that plane and bring them back to Kabul. So after that, um, the ambulance, they just came and took them all to the hospital. And um, the, the interesting part is after that, when his parents showed up and they brought me a scarf and they that was the appreciation that he sent us to say thank you that you saved his life and he has his eyes back and he knew he heard a woman voice and I am sure that it was you and it was it was the happiest moment for me for sure it, it just made my day that see there's not everybody hates you here <laughs> there's some people appreciate you here they understand the difference that you made and you at least change one person's perspective and you know, you give him a life back just because of, you know, what I was able to do for him. And it was just very happy for me. Like sometimes like when I see all these pains and threats and our life completely changed and how much we had to go through as a family, just for me to pursue my dream. And uh, it just brings pain. And then when I think about all these positive things, um, it just, you know, it just completely pays off for every bad days I had. And I think I remember, isn't there another event where you had to fly a, uh, there was maybe like a, an Afghan colonel who refused to get on the aircraft at first? Yes, those are actually my very first missions. Oh, yeah. um, this is a good one. So those were my very, very first missions. Um, we had to carry like uh, for the meetings, um, like Afghan uh, generals, colonels, uh, they all use the caravan to be transported to like, for example, if they wanted to do Kandahar base for, you know, uh, some kind of, kind of meetings or whatever, we just had to carry them. And I remember the day that um, they all showed up um, and we were just, pre-flighting the plane and I remember there was like the co-pilots just you know like we were we were just getting ready for our flight and I see there is some you know argument going on in the back of the plane and they are completely um do not want to get on board just because they were asking and they said yes the female is going to be flying and it's her and they just didn't want to fly in my plane they want they thought 
oh, she's very small. She doesn't have the experience. She's going to crash the plane. She's going to kill all of us. And they said, no, they called the squadron and they asked for a different pilot. And uh, thank God that day, all the pilots were gone with the different flights and there was no other planes and no other pilots remained uh, to make that mission. And uh, they said, unfortunately, we don't have any other pilots. If you guys don't want to go, then wait until tomorrow. So that was basically an important event that they had to attend. Um, they had no other choice. And I said, if you just, we just have to leave. If you guys want to leave, we are ready. And they had no other choice. So they all got in the plane. They all seemed like so scared. And they all like, just, I don't know, like I was there to kill all of them, which was, it wasn't the case. It was just because I was on the plane and thank God the weather was very nice that day. There was no gust and it was like a smooth flight. After we landed, I completely cannot believe the person that was fighting and uh, was so upset about me being in the plane and their pilot, he walked into me and he said he was proud of me. And he said, I did not believe on you, but you're good. And I'm glad I see an Afghan female flying now. And he shake my hand and he went. And I was very happy that happened um, because the person I knew like a couple hours ago, it was completely a different person. And most of the time at the beginning, uh, I remember like um, most of them, they would not believe I was Afghan. Uh, one time I heard one of them were saying, oh, she looked very good on the scarf. She's being very polite and respectful of our religion. She's having a scarf on. Oh, she speaks very good Dari. They thought I was an American or I was <laughs> flying in Afghanistan. I'm just being respectful, putting in scarf on. And I just walked into them. I was like, no, I'm Afghan, actually. I do fly in Afghanistan and I was trained in Afghanistan and I am an Afghan officer here. Um, they couldn't even believe it um the first time it was very interesting for them to see like i had a lot of these experiences that most of the time unless i talked like clearly talked they couldn't believe i was afghan um or there was an afghan female flying and and of course one of the things that we haven't even touched on is you get to meet so many interesting people because of this not just military um senior leaders but world leaders in fact um including the first lady of the United States, you're flown back um, for, I need you to help me with the award name, the International Women's, uh, what is it that you you end up receiving? It was International Woman of Courage Award. Yes. Can you, can you just describe that trip that you go on for that for us, please? Absolutely. Um, I was very lucky to be nominated for that award. Um, it was in 2015 uh, when I got a call from the U.S. Embassy that they nominated me uh, for um, the U.S. Uh, International Woman of Courage Award. That was inter like worldwide, like internationally. Um, and I could not believe how how did I got nominated for that. And it was a very, very proud moment for me uh, when um, I had to come in here, not only represent myself, my country, represent the Afghan Air Force. Most of the people in the U.S., they didn't even know after the Taliban, Afghanistan had an Air Force. Afghanistan had a pilot and especially had an Afghan female pilot. Uh, it was unbelievable for them. And mostly because of those girls that I knew, most of the girls in Afghanistan, they just think exactly the way I thought when I was a kid, that they are not able of doing anything and they don't have any voice. Um, they can't be anything. They are like wordless. Their job is just to raise a kid and, you know, be in a housewife, uh, which is very heartbreaking to think about how they viewed themselves. Not only I was happy for receiving this award for myself to representing my country, for those girls that they watch me, that I was one of them. And I started from nowhere just because I believed in myself and I knew nothing can break me if I break myself. That's the only person can make me fail is myself. Um, and I was glad. Um, and um, it was 2015 when I got nominated for the award. I came to the U.S. and... You know, sometimes when the life doesn't feel real, that was another experience for me. The first time I left my country, the first time I was coming to the country that I call it my home now, um, I came here, I I was 
filled with so much love and respect, sometimes you forget where you come from, where the struggles. And that's that was the moment for me that I completely forgot my struggles, the pain me and my family had to go through, um, every threats that we had to go through to survive. Um, just because of so much love people give me here. And I was so blessed um, when I got the award. And of course, it become very, very public. And I got to meet the first lady. And the other great thing is like the first time as we talked about it, um, my dream came true. I got to uh, go to California. I think it was, I can't remember the base, but it was in California. I got to fly with Blue Angels and it was number four, uh, Jeff, uh, which God bless him. Um, it's the same pilot that uh, his plane crashed. And it was absolutely a great moment for me. It, it didn't seem real. It was like completely like a dream when you see and you're having so much fun. You're getting to meet completely opposite people that no matter male or female, they all give you so much love and respect. Sometimes I don't realize as much as love and respect I received from people here. I was just shocked. I didn't know. I was like, I did something I served my own country. I am in Afghan Air Force in Afghanistan. I did nothing for this country. How come people seize me and respect me? Like I did something for the US. And it just gave me the beauty of, I think since then, um, that beauty of this country, the people and how united this country is, it just gives me the feeling of, I don't know how to, how to even describe it. And I had a very great experience. Um, all I can say is. <laughs> and, and of course, you come back later for C-130 training. You're one of, I think, six officers selected. You're the only woman yet again. I found it very amusing that one of the other uh, candidates is the son of the general of the base. So probably not there on merit like you. Um, but of course, you go through the training and then you realize your family is in grave danger and they're having to move around quite a bit and you request political asylum in the U.S. And can you talk through the decision there? And that's kind of where the book ends. So I don't know what has happened since. Obviously, we're talking now and I'm very interested to know what has happened uh, beyond that. But um, you apply for asylum. You get some help. Talk us through that. What was that moment like for you? Absolutely. Um, you know, that was the moment. Sometimes I don't, I don't think, sometimes I feel like how much or if the decision I made was right or not. Sometimes when it's the matter of saving yourself, your career, your family, you know, like yourself, you have a family and you understand the priority always is your family, no matter what happens to yourself as an individual. And I think the day that I started, I knew it was a risk. I knew it wasn't an easy path, but it, with everything that my family had to go through, um, the main reason that I had to came to the U.S. for the training is because we had to go through so much threats that for months, sometimes for days and months, I couldn't fly. I couldn't even leave my home. We had to hide not only because of the Taliban, my own extended family were our main um, enemies, that they were just there to kill smallest member of my family, which uh, most people that they're familiar with, they understand the matter of honor kill doesn't go away just because I left Afghanistan. It does not go away. The shame is still there. And for my extended family and the people that they thought I brought shame or I'm not a Muslim anymore, they thought if even, no matter if they can't reach me, if they hurt the youngest person in my family or my father, or my brother, or my mom, no matter who, it will be an honor for them. They did their job and it never went away, even though I came to the U.S. and for the training to get away from all of that. So maybe the people just relax and say, OK, she's not here anymore. But that wasn't the case. While I was here going through the training, my family had to deal with a lot and to the moment that they even had to leave the country without me being aware of. And 
it, it just, they would not bother me just because I had to go through training and they knew it would be difficult. Uh, but when I hear it afterward that how much they had to struggle just while I was here and not telling me about it just to not stress and um, affect my training, it breaks my heart that I wasn't there for them when they were there for me. And it really, really break my heart. And to the moment that, you know, it was a big achievement and I wanted them to know if everything we had to go through, it all paid off. Nothing silenced me or nothing made me quit. Um, because, you know, like if I did quit, it wouldn't be the point that I was not good or I wasn't able to do my job or, you know, my life was so difficult that they put me in that situation. Always the blame would come back to me that I was a female and I couldn't handle it. It was so hard for me. And that's why I quit. And that was the reason, no matter what, um, I I never chose to quit just because of the female being a female that always points out to you that because I was a female, I quit. That moment when I realized I was getting done with training, I had to return home with the pride of, you know, graduating. And now I get to fly this plane, uh, which is you know, a nice plane and a bigger plane. And I did it exactly like my male co colleague did. And we all graduated at the same level. Um, unfortunately, my family left Afghanistan. They went to Pakistan and just running away as Kabul is very small. No matter where part of, which part of Kabul you hide, you still at some point can meet someone else along the way. And for them, it was so difficult to live there anymore because I still had a sister that uh, she was going to college and it was hard for her to make it through the school. Um, and that was the moment, the first time ever when my father told me, I can't return to this anymore. Um, someone going to get killed this time and you have no one else to return to. And I had only a family to return to. Everyone else, including my own extended family, they were not there for me. They were there to hunt me the same day I get there. And that was a very hard moment for me to make that decision to choose my family and quit on my career. And after that, it was very hard for me for a long time. Um, I couldn't get through of, for a, again, for the second time, I lost my country. For the second time, I lost the dreams that I worked so hard for. I got separated from my family, which was the hardest part. I haven't seen them, I mean, for 10 years going oh. forward after that. And all of us, we were all over the place. My family, my brother and my sister, she had to flee to Turkey uh, to save their life, a career, a life for them, because there was no life for them in Pakistan or Afghanistan. And my sister, one sister with my parents left in Afghanistan with no future in a hidden. And here was me and in, in, in the U.S., you know, to build a new life, a new, I mean, everything you have to start from zero and you don't know what the future will bring. And I didn't know what would happen to my life. I didn't know if I ever would be able to fly again. And start from that, you know, I always been blessed in life to meet a great people. And this is when I met my husband and um, he served the country for, you know, more than 13 years. Um, he definitely knows about Afghanistan, about mm -hmm. uh, he'd been all over all these wars that was going on. And I mean, you know, sometimes I say in life that the way to success is never just me. And I would never say it's just me. Sometimes we forget the people that they are behind us to do the job for us. And that's how I see it as well. It's always we. And I really appreciate those people in my life um, that they stood with me and they fought the way true the same as I did. Uh, because without them, I don't think I would have been alive or here. Are, and, are you a U.S. Uh, citizen? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep going, please. No, no, I am not. Actually, that yeah. was a very, very hard, um, hard moment because, you know, with the government changed and the situation of the U.S. itself, um, it's never the immigration process is never, ever um, like stable. It's so different for one person can take six months for one person can take two years. And unfortunately, uh, my asylum took forever. 
And um, I ha- during that time, I just didn't know what to do with my life. And it was very, for a person that I fought so hard, I was like a useless person. I fought my way. I had to go to the FA so many times to see if I can convert my flight hours, whatever I have had in Afghanistan. The answer always been no. They told me I can't. They told me I can't use these hours. I had to go start from zero. I have to go get the U.S. license. And, you know, like someone like me coming to the U.S. and, uh, you know, have to start a life from zero. It's hard um, to especially go to the civilian world. And it's so expensive. And at that point, I thought I'm not able to do it. I would ever be able to get back. I start going through you know, like everything I have in life or the reason I'm alive or my family that we are reunited again, it's because of the U.S. male or female in uniform. And I will always be forever thankful for them that they always stood by me. And I completely respect them in a different level. Um, You know, even though they changed my life, they give me a life back. And, you know, like for the second time, as I said, I lost a country. This time it was so different. Um, sorry, I just get so emotional. <laughs> yeah, it makes me emotional hearing it. It's pretty amazing. Even thinking about it is when I lost my country for the second time, I did not feel it. Um, you know, like I have heard about US is like a country you can achieve your dreams, you can be anyone and you can start a life here and and that's what had happened to me and i never felt since then that i lost a country yeah i i felt like my dreams were lost but i knew if i every time we think about struggles about giving up when we think about a hope a symbol of hope and there's always something in for us if we work hard for it that will always happen. And I think that's how it motivated me to go forward. And and I think just being here, just feeling that how much free as a human I can be. I can be the same human. I can be same as other, even Americans. Beside the citizenship, there's no difference. I can start a life from zero And I can go as high as I want without no limitation. I just have to work hard for it. And that's what it, I always heard it. And I, since, since I start living in the U.S., I realized that this is so true. This is so true about the people that actually take this country for granted. I would have one word to say, you know, sometimes when we live or born in a country, it's not your choice. I mean, it wasn't my choice. But what we have, sometimes we don't realize what we have. It it completely changed my life, even though I had to start a life at the age of 20 something in the US, everything from zero, but there was no stop. There was nothing for me to tell me I was a woman or I wasn't a good enough. It just motivated to do motivated me to do more. People that as much as love and respect I have received from everyone, it motivated me to do more and more what I have done already. Because in a country that I had nothing, I have fought my way through. In this country that there is no limitation for me, um, I can even do more than what I did. And um, that's what it kept me motivated that um, all the great people that were stood behind me and helped me. Um, So I had to do interpretation jobs for a little while, um, you know, just to get, uh, you know, just just to feel not worthless of not being able to do anything uh, to the point I got very lucky again in life that there was a school. They said they can provide me scholarship um, because I already knew everything. I just it was the matter of licenses to receive. And I will forever be thankful for them. They started that route for me. Um, I started going to that flight school and uh, receiving my pilot license. I started getting my private license all the way to my CFII. And um, that was the moment after years and years, five years of not flying and not even thinking about this dream would ever be possible again. Uh, with me starting a life here, um, you know, when none of my experiences counted, 
how I can ever start all over again. It requires so much money and, um, you know, to pursue that, pursue that dream, um, which I was very lucky again and thankful for those people to open that route for me. And I start flying again. Every day I would fly, I would be thankful that I am here and I do what I love to do. And um, which is which is rare because I completely forgot where and what the struggles I came through, it all just vanished. Like it just completely disappeared because I completely found a new hope, a new meaning for life. Um, that if one where one place I wasn't good enough, or I was, they were just killing me f- just because of wearing a uniform. Here it is. I have it more than what I expected. And, um, you know, just, just doing that, it just brought so much hope in my life that I started fighting for more and wanted to do more. And, uh, just for the happiness of being up where I belong in the mm-hmm. sky that just brought so much hope. And, um, uh, I mean, freedom to my heart again. Do you, do you believe one day you'll have your family come over to join you? Well, that's another story. Um, so my family is here. Yes. Um, All right. Yeah. I was wondering what happened. Okay. Uh, Great. So after years of, you know, having no one, no, none of my family here, you know, my biggest support was my husband. And he, you know, sometimes when I talk about men, most people would think she is against men. I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm not. Actually. You know, like the people behind my success always been men. If it was my father, my brother, my husband, it was all of these great men that supported me through life to be where I am. And I only talk about the extremists and the males that they are so selfish of power yeah. that they think if they hurt someone smaller than themselves, it will be, it will make them look bigger or powerful, which is not true. My word to them is, if you want to be a stronger, go fight stronger than yourself, bigger than yourself, not smaller than yourself. Someone that you can attack and you think you're smaller, that does not make you a bigger and stronger man. And um, so again, going back to the story, um, while I was living here and being away from my family for years and years, I never saw any of them. And as I say, my uh, parents were in Afghanistan. Uh, my sister was in Afghanistan and they were still living in hidden without my extended family knows where they live. Um, unfortunately, when uh, the collapse of Afghanistan in 2021 happened, um, that was that was another nightmare. Um, you know, when sometimes you don't think about something will ever happen. Unfortunately, as an Afghan, we hope our hopes disappears in a matter of years. It never lasts. It never lasts forever. The freedom we find, it disappears very quickly. And the hope we find, it all disappears again. And unfortunately, the moment that Afghanistan collapsed again for the second time to the Taliban, I had my parents, my sister, like still living in Afghanistan. I remember that day, I couldn't even believe it. It was so painful. It was very, very painful. It brought so much pain into my heart that I couldn't even believe that was the reality. That what hurt me the most is that you know, most Afghans viewed Americans in Afghanistan completely a different way, including myself and my family. They were this they were the symbol of hope for us in Afghanistan because when they were present, we knew our life, especially as a woman, was completely different. We had a voice, we had an education. I was the one found my voice, found my dream and you know, hopes through those time period. And I can't believe. I just, in a blink of eyes, it all went, it disappeared. And the terrifying situation was that I just, that moment, I couldn't believe it, what would happen to my family. And again, when I say I have so much respect for the people in uniform, they helped me. I was in the US and I locked myself in a room. Anyone that I knew, they knew me. I just reached out and those people... I will always be forever thankful for them. 
those men and females in uniform. They were in Afghanistan still. They were helping with the withdraw and most of them in the U.S., they did not sleep for days, day and night. They were up with me on the phone where my family is. And they tried to get them out. They said, even if they can't make it to the airport, we would go and send um, our our groups that they were helping um, to go out in the city to bring them into the base because it was very hard for them. Uh, where my parents left, there was already a Taliban checkpoint there that they would check the passports, the IDs, everything when whoever would cross that point to go to the airport. Um, and again, they managed, they helped me so well days and nights. It was three in the morning, two in the morning, 12 at night. Um, they would just be on the phone with me to get my family into the airport, which we finally did. And I remember after a week of going through all of this, as soon as my parents made it to the airport, my sister with her six month old baby and the terrifying situation they have seen into the airport, um, my mom had a nightmare. Like when, even for the first year, she would get up and scream that, the horrifying situation that they saw in Kabul airport that the kids got shot or it, it was, it was completely a nightmare that no one ever believed this would happen at this time of the year. Um, so my family just got to the airport uh, with the help of those great people that I will always be thankful for. Um, they went to Dubai and from Dubai, they came to Wisconsin so they spent uh, a little while in Wisconsin. And I remember the first time we ever, ever, um, after a long time, oh my God, it was unbelievable. It was the happiest moment for all of us. And we we were like just so much filled with happiness. Um, and I just consider myself very lucky to be able to reunite with them again. Uh, so my parents, my sister, they made it to Florida. And uh, since then, they've been here. Uh, and then I have a brother and a sister that they got stuck in Turkey when they fled. Um, again, um, it's like so much into the story. Sometimes I just forget, um, you know, like where to start. Uh, but again, um, for my sister and my brother, they were living in Turkey um, when um, in 2021, I think it was 2022 when I got nominated for a gathering of eagles in the staff college. Um, so I got nominated for that award and I went there. So I was very lucky again to meet uh, the 21st uh, chief of staff of the Air Force, General David Golfin. And this man is an angel for all of us, like a, a Completely an angel. When an angel lands in your life, sometimes they land in the face of human. And sometimes we don't realize who we have in life. And I was speaking on that event. And after he heard my story, he completely got involved in my life, in my family's life. And he said he will help me as much as he can. And because of that man, day and night, he worked since then to get my family out of Turkey. Wow. And he is up to now helping my family, myself. He reached out to the U.S. Embassy in Turkey. Um, he tried to, you know, do anything that is in his power. Um, and the great part is that no one believes a day before that the hur um, the earthquake happened in Turkey. I'm not sure if you are yeah. aware of that was a very bad earthquake that so many people died. And it happened exactly to the same city that what my brother and my sister was living. A day before that, um, the general got my family out of Turkey and they made it to the U.S. Um, again, they made it to Florida. And that last wish of my mom was if she reunites for the last time with whole family after everything we've been through, after all the separation, if she can once hug his her grandchild, and I told them this would be possible and this will happen. And because of this man, um, now we are all together. We all live in Florida, entire my family, entire my sibling. We are happily living here. Um, and I just can't ask for more. It's that's so great. 
just the great people. And I just don't know why it's me. <laughs> you know, yeah. sometimes you just don't realize why it is me. And this is the moment I just think that so much that I have been blessed with and the great people in my life that I have met along the way, um, that if it wasn't because of them, I would never be where I was, the success and achievement I received. And most importantly, that we are all together again. And, you know, especially in a safe place and in a country that no one will make them feel this is not their home. This will always be their home. And I always will remind them that. That's so great. Oh, what a great ending to this. Well, the story so far. And I don't think any of this, like when you say, why did this happen to you? I don't feel like this is luck in any way. It's a lot of hard work that you and the and sacrifice that the family put in, like these people helping you along the way know of you because you've done so much. So it's it's certainly not by luck that it's happened. Um, the, the last two things, and then I promise I'll let you go here, uh, Neil Far. One is, um, is there anything that you carried with you when you were flying or that you still carry with you when you're flying that's like a good luck charm, something that somebody gave you that you just like to have on you while you're flying? Um, so that's the interesting part is that I always had a ring that that ring was when I actually just graduated from school, my dad gave me and just for him that I managed to graduate from a school. And that was a dream for me to get done. That made him so proud that I graduated from school. And, you know, that ring until nowadays, that always been in my bag. And everywhere I go, I would just carry that. And I'm just so afraid to wear it even because I'm afraid to lose it yeah. or it gets rusty. And I think that's the only thing I always carry with me. Um, it's just a matter of the love of that achievement, first achievement in life that I have received from my dad. And it just, it just always reminds me of just do good, be yeah. good. That's great. That's a great one. And then um, I did, as I was looking up, um, obviously your book, did I get this right that you also sell rugs from the region? Yes. Um, so the moment that um, when I said I didn't know what to do with my life and I started doing interpretation and stuff. So luckily, um, you know, for something that um, my husband thought that would make me happy and make me feel like I do still something about my country and I still carry on onto, you know, something from my homeland, uh, we decided to open this rock company, which is called Afghanistan Tribal Rock uh, Trading Company. And uh, we start getting uh, importing rocks from Afghanistan with the help of my dad. Um, so to, you know, bring that beauty of, because rugs have a special place in my heart and especially Afghan rugs that I know how hard it is to make those. There's a females and kids and they work for months uh, with their hand to make that and how much love and, you know, work it takes to build it and make it. And I just you know, like we just like love this beauty about it, like the rugs and something about Afghanistan. Um, we decided to open that and um, it's so online business. Um, so we, I'm glad we did. <laughs> now I have something of Afghanistan to still be proud of and carry in life. Um, you know, every time looking at them, that it came from my homeland and um, that's something we can do. That's really cool. Yeah, I saw that. So I, I plan on getting one of those myself um, oh, thank through you. this. Yeah, they look great. And I would just say as we end here, Nilofar, uh, I, I, I would recommend your book to a lot of folks, aspiring pilots, um, people who want to hear about overcoming adversity, dealing with challenges, being the first at something. And um, we've also on this program, we had the first woman uh, reservist to pass ranger school which is wow. no easy task and a lot of publicity that comes with it and a lot of hatred that comes with, with being the first. So I'm so honored that you let us have you on here to talk about your story. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was my honor um, talking to you as well. And thank you for your service in Afghanistan and everything you have done. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, um, you know, for those men and women who served in Afghanistan is, 
that you guys definitely made a change in Afghanistan. And no matter what happened recently, um, I know every one of them, their heart were broke for what happened. And, um, you know, I just want to say we are thankful. And like me, so many other girls, no matter what happened recently in Afghanistan, we will always carry that, that all the great things you have done for us and our country, and especially the voices that we have received because of you guys. And it will always, always be in our heart and we will always uh, carry it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. This one felt more real than many, I think. I don't know if it's just, you know, having flown in Afghanistan and seeing flying over a girl's school every every time we took off was pretty inspiring because it was hard to know if we were making progress in that country. Obviously, we'd go and we'd kill a lot of people and we'd, we'd win at the tactical level, but you just could never tell what was going on at the strategic level when you're a junior officer flying around at the tactical side. But you could tell every day when you flew over a girl's school and these little girls are going into classrooms and they're like Nilufar, um, having an opportunity, possibly for the first time in their lives, to do something like that. And it makes the fall of Afghanistan in 2021 even more tragic as you envision probably a 16, 17, or 18-year-old girl who had the same dreams Nilufar had, but was simply at, at the wrong place at the wrong time, and everything collapsed, and her dreams of becoming a pilot or a surgeon or, or a teacher just evaporated. And you hope that the time that we spent there, so many of the people we've interviewed on this program, and so many of you listening who bled over there, that you inspired enough that maybe there's a slight chance of change that we see over time. Um, so it's just something I reflect on. And then the, the second part with this episode is just uh, how tough it was for her to follow her dream and, and the sacrifices of her family and to be reunited now. That's pretty special. I think it gives me a renewed perspective that I need every now and then being in this very comfortable place that we call America and these cushy jobs that many of us have. I know some of you are actually doing real work. You're out there driving trucks and working on farms and actually getting your hands dirty. For, for those of us like me who are flying a desk and type all day, um, it's a good reminder of how tough many people have it and how great we do. So I appreciate you staying tuned this long. Um, I'd appreciate it if you can subscribe, thumbs up, leave a positive comment, especially for Nilufar. Um, if you have time to leave a positive review, that would be fantastic. All of this helps us get these out to more people. So thank you for listening. Thank you for our supporters on Patreon. Uh, we got some new things coming, folks. We've got uh, some in-person interviews that we're doing. Uh, give us more time on target, as it were. Um, get some fun stuff in as well with these guests and revamping our newsletter a little bit. So if you're interested, you can head over to the website. Thank you for being listeners and supporting us and people like Nilu Far who sacrifice so much. Stay safe, y'all. <laughs>